Hello, I'm John Boaz. I'm a board member with the Rancho, Rancho Bernardo Historical Society. We're at the museum on Monday, April 6th to talk with Bruce Kornblum about his role in the development of Rancho Bernardo Community Park. He is an attorney. He was a local attorney at the time uh, that the park opened in 1983, a 38-acre park at that time that included eight uh, ball fields. Uh, he was president of the RB Recreation Council in the years 1984 to 1991. He started the RB Sports Hall of Fame in 1986 to honor youth sports volunteers and he served on the boards of the youth soccer club, the youth basketball, Little League, and Pony League. And as a result, he was inducted into the RB Hall of Fame in 1997. Bruce, we're delighted to have you with us to talk about the park. Uh, let me begin by asking uh, how you came about your interest in sports and recreation. Well, the first thing that happened was I found Rancho Bernardo. And uh, at the time, in 1976, I, uh, my sons were age uh, five and nine. And uh, it was a much smaller town. And I noticed uh, over the first year or so that uh, much of the activity of Rancho Bernardo younger family was around their children and new sports. And that inevitably brought me into uh, contact with, uh, but I was never a player, so I, I, I didn't jump into coaching or anything. But when I thought about it, I felt that if I was going to decide to grow up with my kids, which I decided at that time to become active with their lives, I had to know about the games that they were playing. So I studied them. I uh, sought out uh, professional players and asked them if they give me an hour of their advice. And, uh, and I learned about uh, two sports in particular, uh, baseball and basketball. I understand you're, uh, one of your sons is a baseball coach to this day. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I was surprised uh, because everybody in my family is uh, connected with the law. Uh, going back to my uh, aunt, who was a, the first judge in Buffalo, a lady judge. Uh, but uh, he did not want to be a lawyer. He said, I worked too hard. And I saw that he fell in love with the community. His friends were uh, all playing sports. And he became very involved in baseball. And it kept him happy. And uh, he continued uh, playing. Uh, throughout high school, uh, dedicated himself, and ended up, unfortunately for me, uh, going to college in Texas on a baseball scholarship, and has, is now uh, a resident of Texas. Well, obviously your leadership has something to do with your legal training and background and experience. Tell us a little bit about uh, where you went to school and, and how you got to San Diego and what your area of interest in law is. Well, uh, I came to San Diego, it was, a, a, when I look back on it, an interesting uh, story. Uh, I was a, uh, a lobbyist uh, for the trial lawyers in Sacramento, and I would present legislation to various committees. And one of the committees was chaired by a senator from San Diego, uh, James Mills, and a non-lawyer. And he was a uh, scholar, a historical scholar of, of the history of San Diego. And so he, for some reason, uh, took to me. And his advisor, uh, uh, one day after presenting uh, some legislation to his committee, he asked if I would uh, hang around. And he said his advisor was going to become a judge. And uh, he wanted to replace that uh, political and historical advisor uh, with me. And he said, did you ever consider moving to San Diego? So I said, obviously not. And he said, well, come on down and visit. I have a place that I think you and your wife and your two young children would love. 
And we drove up a, a two-lane highway out of San Diego. Uh, my heart was pounding because I didn't see any houses. And we came to San Diego, uh, to Rancho Bernardo. And he helped pick out the house I'm still living in. And, uh, and then uh, we saw the community, which was much smaller then, um, Be, uh, have a connection through their families. And so uh, I became involved uh, in sports and uh, my practice, uh, I practice uh, as a tribe lawyer in the field of insurance. Um, so that's basically uh, the answer to that. Okay, thank you. I uh, understand that uh, AVCO community developers uh, took initial responsibility for recreation in this newly created uh, community. Um, could you talk a little bit about the evolution uh, from AVCO's involvement to uh, the involvement of uh, RB Swim and Tennis and the Westwood Club uh, on to uh, the Recreation Council and ultimately the community park? In one sense. <laughs> Maybe that will require a paragraph. <laughs> well, so, uh, some of that answer uh, I learned of. I was not a, a, a participant in the actual uh, arrangement of the present park or the acquisition of that park for recreation. But <clears throat> at the time, uh, of course, Rancho Bernardo uh, was originally a, an adult community. But because there was uh, a lot of industry that came to Rancho Bernardo, Hewlett Packard and others, um, uh, residential communities were needed. And so you had Westwood uh, and um, maybe Gatewood Hills in the early 70s. Well, what happened was that transformed the community and uh, children had to have places to play games. Uh, when I first moved here, uh, there were four fields uh, that Hewlett Packard allowed the community to use. And it was great fun, uh, but then Hewlett Packard gave almost like a year notice that they were going to have to withdraw and give different use to those fields. And so uh, the community had no place to put the children. Now, when uh, AFCO was developing uh, the residential areas, they convinced the city of San Diego to allow them not to dedicate a park for recreation, but rather to have two um, recreation clubs. One, Westwood, would have two baseball fields, and the other was uh, swim and tennis, which had no baseball fields, but a lot of other activities, uh, which was consumed by the parents. And so, given the expansion of the city, of Rancho Bernardo, uh, the um, withdrawal of the, uh, of the fields. A group that was ahead of me uh, went down and lobbied for the city to give us a community park. Ahead of you as a recreation council or? Uh, ahead uh, of me as a residence. They, as a residence. They were more familiar and I was just coming into community activities. Uh, I see. And so, um, uh, the park is far different from other uh, community parks. Uh, I learned that uh, the city of San Diego is, is uh, extremely dedicated to outdoor recreation. And in fact, uh, the, uh, at that time, the third largest budget item behind police and fire was uh, recreation, the Department of Parks and Recreation. And the city's plan at that time, it may have changed over the years, which uh, after I ceased my involvement in these activities, uh, that every home be within a quarter of a mile of a park. And so you had neighborhood parks, which were one to three acres, which did not have facilities on them. Uh, the next, uh, just grass uh, type of situation. The, other, the next level was uh, uh, community parks. And they were generally about 10 to 18 acres, and they had permanent facilities as well as fields. Uh, well, by the time our need hit us, the need to house children so that they could compete, um, the basic town was built and we couldn't fit a community park as such. So the city gave us the present 38 acres. 
to develop. Uh, after that, uh, now, um, oh, after that, um, the fields became the first prime item, and within a year thereafter, we had eight fields with nothing else. If you go to the community park now, you would have to envision that all there was was eight fields, grass, and nothing else. Uh, and so, um, there was a local recreation uh, council, but uh, at that time, which I was invited into in this last year, uh, they were uh, committed to building a, uh, an outdoor bowl that could house entertainment for a large amount of people. Uh, there was an activity in Rancho Bernardo called the Symphony on the Greens, where the Rancho Bernardo uh, uh, RBN, the RBN, uh, every Sunday allowed their greens, uh, not their greens, but their uh, fairways to be used, where people would come with uh, blankets and sit and listen to professional uh, groups, the King and King's Trio, the uh, Mills Brothers. Uh, but they then withdrew uh, and, and wanted uh, to end that commitment. And so this group for, was formed to build an outdoor bowl. Well, what happened was uh, that group had to lobby the city for permits, for uh, approval of plans, and uh, the Department of uh, Parks and Recreation, the director, said there's a conflict between recreation uh, and uh, the bowl because uh, the uh, local uh, committee should not have to lobby for anything. They should carry out parks and recreation. So he came up here, at, it was actually my second meeting, and he was very stern and he said, from here on in, I'm withdrawing parks and recreation from, the, uh, from this group. And if you want to form a new group, that's fine. If you don't want to form a new group, I'll appoint one. And so... Uh, Who is he? Oh, that was uh, uh, George Loveland, mm -hmm. who was the director of parks and recreation. Director of parks and rec. I had met him. Uh, his son was growing up with my younger son. And as they grew up, they ended, he, he lived in San Pasquale. And so I had met him because he was rooting for his son and I was rooting for my son. And, and, uh, but the parents were, were rooting together. Yeah. And uh, so I um, and one other person, so that meant 25 did not want to concern themselves with parks and recreation. And that was Stu Blaster. Uh, so Stu and I were the only two that withdrew. And I went down and met Loveland. And I said, what's it all about? Uh, what should we do to create, uh, to continue on with rec rec recreation? And he said, uh, he gave me the history of parks. And he said, you have, free, uh, you have fields up there. He said, that place has to be developed. And from my perspective, it's developed by the community, the community decisions that are made within fair rules. And so Stu and I, and um, one other uh, individual, uh, Paul Brown, who was with the paper, the local uh, Rancho Bernardo News, I think it was. Uh, he knew a lot about the history of, of the community, which I felt I didn't. And we created bylaws, and, uh, and I said, there's one other thing. I said, uh, this is such a community, uh, uh, an active community, the, the future board should be elected, not appointed by anybody. The people should decide who is going to represent them in the activities. And I had to sell Loveland on that idea because the other community parks, of which there was approximately 51, they were all run by athletic, uh, athletic participants, jocks, who could become members just by attending three meetings and then they would run the place. And uh, he said that it was a fair idea to have it. He says, if it could be arranged, he says, I, I agree. And, and that's how our uh, Recreation Council came as an elected body. And uh, thereafter, uh, Stu and I, and with the assistance of Paul Brown, we said, we got to pick a board. And we got to, we got to uh, 
uh, make it a broad based sport, and, and that's what it's done. Very good. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, 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 how the site was selected for the community park. That, that maybe was before your time, but you may have some recollection about that. I'm curious because you mentioned the average community park in San Diego was like 10 to 18 acres, and we're fortunate to have a much larger community park. Right. Well, uh, the uh, people that uh, lived here at that time were very active in keeping uh, the land in, as it was in nature. And so you have, from Rancho Bernardo to the ocean, vast amounts of land that are preserved for posterity. And there was a, uh, at that time, there was a lake called Lake Hodgins, but it was a true lake. And it had water in it. I don't know what happened to the water. <laughs> there's a bunch of trees out there now. But next to that, there was a, a field that the city uh, felt it could carve out that was suitable because it was flat. And uh, so we ended up with 38 acres, uh, not knowing, uh, I, again, was not a, per a personal participant in that, but I became active as they started building the park. Uh, so it was uh, by uh, happenstance, circumstance, uh, nothing planned with regards to the boundaries of the park. So uh, you were not involved in the uh, original development of the ball fields on the land that uh, presently is the park. But at the point you came in, the old rec council uh, interested in a bowl uh, evolved into an elected uh, council and that group was then responsible for the further development of the park. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the steps. Well, uh, because Stu and I agreed, uh, uh, Stu was retired and uh, a, a successful businessman who moved to Rancho Bernardo uh, and uh, developed a, a, a sincere love for the place. And I was still working, so uh, I said, if we're both going to do this, we have to go out and select people. Uh, you have a lot of time to do that. Uh, let's talk about it. Who do we want? And so we went over the, we, we sat down one time with a Bernardo News and we were reading each community's activities to see if we could identify an individual who was active in recreation and who appeared to be accepted by that neighborhood put in Rancho Bernardo as a leader. Uh, the first one uh, we, uh, that I read a lot about was uh, Ed Brown uh, in Oaks North. Uh, Oaks North had a little uh, community uh, uh, recreation center. And so uh, I wrote down Ed Brown. And then uh, we had a basketball coach who had just won three CIF championships named Neville Sainer. And basketball was a big thing in Rancho Bernardo in its infancy, and of course still is. And so I went out and uh, talked to him and he initially didn't know what I was talking about, <laughs> but I said we need you because every kid who bounces a basketball knows your name. And if you could come out and, and, and lend us your expertise and just your presence, uh, you're going to put a lot of smiles on people's faces. And he says, okay, I'll give it a try. And then we uh, knew we needed uh, tennis courts, so there was a um, a, a, uh, actually a pro uh, uh, named Melissa Porzak. And uh, Melissa was a, uh, a very attractive, tough tennis player. Uh, knew, uh, uh, she was very good, but she knew about the history of tennis when we talked to her. And uh, she said that she felt uh, that she had enough knowledge that if a place was built that she could put it all together. And, uh, and then I remember there was, uh, at one meeting, there was a, uh, an old man, an 85-year-old man who came in and he said, I was wondering if I could address the board. And I said, certainly. And he loved roller skating. He was a roller skater. He was a dentist, a retired dentist. And he um, uh, 
wanted to build a, um, I can't think of the name, that round thing that's at the bottom. The gazebo? The gazebo. <laughs> and I said, well, what are we going to do with the gazebo? And he said, well, kids could roller skate in the gazebo. And uh, I uh, looked at our, the city, uh, which uh, gave us an advisor to tell us about uh, what we could and couldn't do. And, and he said, we don't have any gazebos. But uh, we thought it was a great idea because at the time the park was, was built, there were no trees. Uh, the, uh, the original uh, person gave us these little cheap trees that were maybe uh, six inches high and said, <laughs> come back in 30 years and you'll have shade. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I remember Dr. Maxwell, and, and I remember when we told him a month later that we wanted to accept his idea. He had plans and everything, and we took those plans, and, and that's how the gazebo started. Uh, there was another businessman, Frank Berry, who uh, owned a sports shop uh, in town, and, um, and so we went, uh, and that was our first board. And we so all we're up to about... Nine, ten. Uh, I think I ended at nine. I can't nine. remember one or two. There was uh, oh, there was one of, as the uh, casas were being built, and just about the, no, they had just opened. Um, we uh, felt that it would be important to have a person from the casas come down, uh, and then and there were a, a lot of. Uh, this is the. Retirement, the retirement building community. just across, the, just north of the park. Right. Yeah. And then I noticed that lawn bowling was very big amongst many of the seniors. And I knew nothing about lawn bowling. And so um, I obtained the name of the world's greatest lawn bowler, who was in, uh, I think, uh, lived in Washington, someplace, mm -hmm. Seattle. Or, because uh, I learned that there, you had to build them in a special way, special grass, special everything. And so he came down and he told <laughs> the board about lawn bowling. So I said, well, how much is one of these things? And he said, no, he said, you have to keep in mind, you don't build one, you have to build two. And I said, why? He said, well, one can be used, but two will allow for national and even international competition. If you have one, you close out that field. So anyway, it ended up uh, that the uh, field cost $350,000. <laughs> and it had to be kept up in a special way every year. So, uh, um, so it was those types of, Melissa put together the, uh, the, the organized the tennis. Uh, we uh, encouraged uh, the lawn bowlers in order to pay for their facility. I mean, the facility was paid for out of funds that were the city had available for us. Uh, but um, uh, the lawn bowlers would determine how many lawn bowlers there were, the, the annual cost, which was about twenty-five to thirty thousand, divide the members into the cost, and that was the dues. And so the park developed uh, in incremental ways uh, in that fashion. And then the park was so big. Uh, so you're saying that uh, essentially the cost of the lawn bowling was borne by the lawn bowlers. Yes. Was this concept then extended across basketball and tennis and? Yes. Uh, most people, uh, as the groups developed, whenever they had disputes and some of the disputes were uh, unbelievable. I mean, the hatreds between members and whatever the thing was, they felt they had to come to the uh, Recreation Council to resolve it. And so we had disputes from the lawn bowlers, from the tennis players, from, um, well, uh, to stop the those two. And we had no time for business. And, and, and so we decided that uh, my legal expertise, so my legal background, came in to play because I was able to write bylaws. I was, I was very knowledgeable and Robert Drew was a lawyer. And so we, um, I said, look, let's get these groups out of here so we can do business. And th we decided that each group would be self-governing. Uh, I wrote the bylaws for them and they could change them. The only time they could come to the Recreation Council 
was if the dispute was so irre irreconcilable <laughs> that we had to step in and end it. So you were an appeals court. An appeals court. <laughs> and we did that for the tennis players, and uh, fortunately, no, no appeal ever thereafter came. Oh. They, they took care of uh, it themselves. Uh, but it allowed for each one to then develop their own history, their own traditions, their own practices, and it ended up to be the best thing we could do. Mm -hmm. Now the uh, Ed Brown Senior Center was founded in 1989. Uh, you've, you've already commented that Ed Brown was one of the original board, and you commented that Casa Line just north uh, perhaps have, had some influence in, in that development. Um, is there anything more that you can tell us about uh, Ed Brown and the development, the plans for the, the, the senior center, the cost of that perhaps? Uh, Ed Brown was a very, very, very special person. He was uh, a businessman who, uh, in his retirement, uh, he was successful in whatever he did. I, I didn't really go into people's backgrounds that much. But uh, he committed himself to helping people's businesses for nothing. Um, and, and so his personality was extremely important to the development because people liked him, politicians liked him. Uh, he knew the facts. Uh, and so um, one day he uh, said, um, there's a person living in our uh, community named Remy Hudson, who's a member of the, uh, who's a director of uh, the Jocelyn Center. And I, I didn't know what the Jocelyn Center was. So uh, he introduced me to Remy Hudson, who was a senior, uh, uh, I, I would say in his 80s at the time. And, uh, they were running 20, 29 senior centers in Southern California. The Jocelyn. The Jocelyn group. People. And he gave me the history of the Jocelyn group by telling me that Marcellus Jocelyn was a, uh, a very wealthy uh, business person in, who retired in the, uh, I'll say the early 50s. And he was very interested in helping uh, seniors. and he. He created a fund, of, I think it was for four or five million dollars at that time. And he took his, uh, uh, his board at that time, who were his good friends, and named them as the committee, and Remy was one of them. But he said, uh, you know, he says, now we're all up in age and we're running 29 as an overview uh, committee. And we don't have any more time. Uh, in our lives or more time in the day to, for another center. So uh, Ed said, uh, Remy, why don't you just come down, L let us show you the park. And we want to show you one other thing. There's something called the Casa de las Campanas. Uh, that's opening, that's, uh, we'll explain it to you. So we went out to the field and he looked up and he said, uh, oh my God. He said, uh, look, he says, all I can do is I can get you the money, uh, but we cannot run it. You have to do it yourself or you have to make an arrangement with the city. So uh, we went out to get a bid. We got a bid and uh, it ended up to be like a 5,000 or 5,500 square foot uh, building that had movable walls and multi-purpose use. And that became the facility. And so um, I think it was uh, 350,000. 350, so um, I met him at a bank on Bernardo Center. And uh, it was funny, uh, he takes out a checkbook and he says, who, sh who should I make the check out to? And I said, well, to uh, Bruce Corman. <laughs> and he said, that's you, isn't it? And I said, yes. He said, well, give me another name. <laughs> so I said, well, try the city of San Diego. Oh. <laughs> so I said, we deposit that in, and uh, that was the origin of the, uh, of the, um, the building. And then after it was finished, 
Um, I remember uh, he, he said, you have to hire a director. So Ed, Stu, and I met with this woman who was, the, I can't remember her name, but she was delightful. As soon as you walked in, you knew that this woman should run this place. And so it took off like gangbusters. Uh, and, and, um, uh, the first name of the uh, facility was the uh, uh, Johnson Center. Mm -hmm. And then it was changed because that did not have meaning to people that were using it. So there was a name, uh, Remy Hudson. Remy Hudson ultimately ended up to be in, in the same group I was in when we got elected to the Hall of Fame. The, the, uh, the town, uh, Ranch Bernard put him in the Hall of Fame in Proctor, so. But, uh, of course, Remy wasn't that active in the community, and people didn't identify with Remy. But Ed was still active, and Ed was uh, active in the planning of activities at the, uh, uh, the, the Hudson Center. And so uh, it was then, the board uh, then uh, voted, it was after I, I was off the board, but they voted the name uh, at the Ed uh, Brown facility. And so uh, that's the, uh, how we got it, and how it happened, and, uh, and I still go by that place, and every time I uh, look at, uh, just driving by, I think about reading, and I think about it. Mm, wonderful. Uh, the uh, recreation center was built in 1995, yes. and named for Stuart Glassman, whom you've already uh, referred to. Um, in 2002. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, not only Glassman's role in the development of the, the center, but uh, the, the rec council and, 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 yeah. and how that evolved? Well, uh, we knew we needed uh, a gymnasium, the gymnasium at the Westwood Club, for which was holding all of the basketball games, was, was this overwhelmed with numbers. And, uh, of course, the adults wanted to play uh, and have activity. And we needed just more recreation facilities, uh, whether it was for dinners or whatever. And uh, by a, certain, a sheer coincidence, I was uh, having a trial. Uh, and uh, it was a friend, uh, relatively, it was uh, a friendly business trial. Uh, and so I was friendly with the attorney on the other side. Not that that had anything to do with the outcome of the case. After the case, uh, he was a, a community uh, person like I was, and we started talking about our communities. And he was in Carl's band. And so I, uh, he said, we just finished a uh, multi, the building of a multi uh, uh, facility. And I said, what's it all about? And he explained it, and I said, boy, that would fit with our place. And he says, well, tell you what, he says, I'm the chairman of the Recreation Council, and I can get you the plans. And I said, really? And I said, he said, yeah. And he says, you know, they cost about 150000 to the, uh, the architect's charges. He said, but we have no need for them. So I called uh, George Loveland, and I said, uh, I told that story, and I said, uh, could you call uh, uh, Carlsbad and talk to their Parks and Recreation Department? and see if we could get those plans. I said, this building is unbelievable. So he couldn't believe it. So we, and sure enough, they gave the plans to Loveland for nothing. And uh, that was the origin of the plans. There were some modifications uh, caused by the San Diego Engineering Department for various reasons, and one of which was cost. But it, it's virtually the twin of the Carlsbad uh, Recreation Facility. And, uh, of course, Stu was very active in that, and again, as I pointed out earlier, uh, Ed was retired, and so he could do his thing. Uh, uh, Stu uh, um, just fell in love with the concept. And he was on it all the time. He was with the engineers, he was with, uh, we had disputes with the City of San Diego Engineering Department. They wanted to charge us to review the plans that were already approved by the city of Carlsbad. Mm. And that was, that was a political thing. Uh, but we had to pay them thousands, of which we protested. 
and, and, and negotiated, but uh, he was involved with that. And, uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the facility started after I left in 1991. Uh, but uh, it was uh, Stu's uh, love, and uh, where Ed was uh, involved with and had this love affair with uh, senior citizens, uh, planning for them, and, and, uh, and of course he was always down there at the tennis courts. Uh, that was that was Stu's back, the, uh, the the recreation facility. Well, you talked about the main facilities, the Brown Senior Center and the recreation facility, uh, but no park is complete without lighting for the ball fields and uh, snack bar for the parents during softball tournaments and and the like. Well, I I, I just thought of a a circumstance where I was uh, uh, I was interested in getting uh, making it a fundraising type of thing, but I didn't have a concept of how you raise money in running a, a public uh, park. But there were always demands. All the youth groups needed something more, or knew knew this or knew that because of the passage of time and wearing out of uh, things, and. Uh, so I, uh, I contacted the state of California, the Department of Recreation, and asked them if they had funds available so that we could do various things. So the director of Parks and Recreation, who I didn't know, uh, but he knew Senator Mills, and, uh, and, and that came up in the conversation so I could get his attention. <laughs> he came down here, he said, I'll meet you here at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, on a weekday. So I get out there a little ahead of time, and he was up, there was this man, and I said, are you Mr. So-and-so? And he said, yes. And he says, I've never seen anything like this. This is the most beautiful community park I have seen in the state of California. So I said, really? I said, uh, does that mean that we'll get funds? And he says, no. He says, that's the reason you won't get funds. <laughs> He says, because you should see some of the facilities <laughs> that I help uh, manage. And he says, uh, we only have enough funds to give to those areas of those parks that needed to build, needed to improve uh, all, all sorts of that type of thing. And he said, but I'll tell you, he says, uh, I'm going to remember this place. And, and so, um, uh, we needed other things. Um, we needed lighting. The cost of lighting a field is unbelievable. It's $150,000 at that time to light a field. Um, we needed a uh, we needed a uh, snack bar. Of course, you have to build these things like war bunkers because of uh, looting and uh, destruction that takes place. And, and they literally are. I mean, a tank couldn't shoot that thing down. And so um, a, a, a dear friend of mine, a retired builder, uh, who was active in, in uh, athletics, uh, Ovi Kelson, uh, agreed to um, build the uh, snack bar. Well, we needed money. The city did not want to pay or allow its funds to be used for the snack bar. And so um, we came up, uh, the board came upon an idea of uh, raising money through selling uh, for, I forgot what the price was, maybe $500, uh, and you could get your name on the uh, snack bar. And we ultimately were able to raise enough money, uh, and, and so if you go to the snack bar, you'll see the names of all the people or businesses that contributed, and you have all these Kelsey's name, excuse me, as the builder. Uh, we had to build bat uh, bathrooms. And the bathrooms uh, are as they are, but we made sure that they were multi-usable so that you could store equipment and, and, and those types of things. And so there, there were um, um, uh, a lot of things uh, um, that, that we needed, and uh, we needed more uh, 
activity from the city to maintain the fields because we were expanding and so on. But let me say this about the, uh, the, the city of San Diego uh, and their participation in this. Uh, George Loveland told me that he would, at our future meetings, at our first meeting when we were talking about formulas, uh, assign uh, two staff people to come to every one of your meetings. And that these people will be uh, knowledgeable in practice and procedure uh, of the San Diego Parks and Recreation, uh, the history of things so that you can understand what you're doing as you come up with ideas, uh, what funds would be available, and uh, what things you could not do, either because of code or, or whatever. And those people were unbelievable. They were uh, professional recreation people who you, know, you could go out, they could serve for anybody, but they then put suits on and, and maintained their uh, employment within the Department of Recreation. And it was uh, their guidance, um, and they would research things. Uh, I would look over and say, hey, is it possible to do this after listening to what the group wanted? And. Uh, uh, the Department of Recreation was, I heard that it's impossible to work with governments. The city of San Diego's participation made this part uh, uh, what, what it is. Um, I, I, I didn't talk about the financing of the park. Um, AFCO uh, was uh, responsible to pay to the Department of Recreation $200 for every living group, uh, or living unit, unit uh, in, uh, in Rancho Bernardo. Uh, the projected population of Rancho Bernardo was 40,000. It, it probably was maybe 42,000. At that time, it was 15,000 when I was uh, getting a dollar. And so um, he said that you have available to you, now this is the one I came in, the, the fields were there, but nothing else. You have available to you uh, between two and three hundred thousand dollars, but it will grow, as as it, and, and it did, and we acquired more money. But uh, those are the sources of funds that helped build that park. And that park, uh, I don't know what the total cost is, but it was uh, massive, uh, a lot of money. Um, another thing, there was a political. Uh, issue that arose between the Rec Council and the Department of Recreation and the City of San Diego. Um, they, um, we had to fight for certain um, facilities. Uh, basketball was a, uh, a, a significant sport. Uh, Rancho Bernardo had all the sports. We had pony teams and they were competitive, but the kids in school at least at my son's ages, baseball and basketball was the cat's meow. And they all played baseball and basketball. And that's why we had so many good young athletes come out of Rancho Bernardo. And we still do. Um, the planned park had, a, had maybe a basketball court. They didn't have, uh, I mean, one, one basket. And so I went down on a friendly day and I said, hey, this is uh, the importance of basketball to this community. And they said, there's not enough. It will cost $350,000 to build what we have there now. And I said, well, we have to build it. And they said, no. It's, uh, we have other needs because of your park. And uh, You're speaking now of the of basketball. outdoor basketball. Yeah, outdoor basketball. And uh, so it... Um, it, it, it took a long time, but finally, uh, a, a, the head of the engineering department retired, fortunately, and a new one came in, whose son was a basketball player. <laughs> Helps. <laughs> and uh, so I met with him, and he said, you got it. He said, uh, that place needs, with that history, that place needs that, uh, those facilities so the kids could practice. We, were, uh, uh, we ran out of room at the... Uh, Swim and tennis club. They only had a, a small basketball court. We couldn't practice at the Westwood Club because that was used for games 24 hours a day. And so that's how uh, that came about. Uh, 
So there, uh, I'm sure there's many stories uh, that I, I can't re remember uh, at this time, but uh, let me just, uh, oh, there was one other uh, thing that raised millions of dollars for the city that came from our board. Uh, eight fields can raise a lot of money for a lot of groups because there are softball groups, for example, that charge each team maybe $500 to enter a tournament. And, and, and so uh, with eight fields, you could run four games a day. So that's four times 32 times 500. They're raising a lot of money. And uh, they would leave afterwards, not give our community anything. And the fields were damaged. And the local groups had to use their little budgets to, um, uh, to uh, this is getting to the idea of how could we raise money. Mm -hmm. So one day, we talked about it, but we didn't know how to solve the problem. One day, a guy came in who was just the most arrogant president of the Cancer Society. And he wanted to use the facilities to raise money. So, uh, you know, what do you say, the Cancer Society, no? But the guy was so arrogant. So I, I happened to say, uh, oh, by the way, I said, are you guys going to clean up after, you know, you have your field? And he says, this is the Cancer Society. You can't expect us to clean up. So I said, yes, I can. I said, either you promise to clean up or uh, go someplace else. And this guy looked at me, and, but he had no place to go. Right? So he says, all right. So uh, I called uh, Loveland, and I said, does this happen all over the city where these people come in, these groups, you know, well-intended groups, I have nothing, obviously, against the cancer society, but they use the facilities, raise money, and don't share their proceeds? He says, yeah. And I said, uh, I have an idea. I said, anybody that comes in, has to give that local group uh, uh, recreation uh, facility 10% of its gross, whatever it is. And they have to give us uh, a, um, what they have in the bank before the thing starts and an accounting afterwards, and that includes drinks. So uh, he said, wow. He said, uh, you mean for all the facilities? He says, that's a lot of money. And I said, is it unreasonable? And he says, I'll get your spot on the, um, uh, before the city council, can you draw something up in ordinance? I said, I think so. So I went down there and uh, that was my only time in front of the city council and I looked up and there they were. And they said, uh, um, why are you here? What's this all about? And I told them about what happened, just like I told you and I told you 50 groups, and I said, all the money, the millions that are raised. And uh, the city of San Diego, not the city of San Diego, but the local groups, the children, need money to replace and reclaim. And you come in afterwards, and you have to have money for your cleanup people and janitors. And uh, one councilman said, what took you so long to get here? <laughs> It passed, I think it was nine or nothing, within seconds, and uh, they said thank you. <laughs> but it was that particular thing that then started, we went from a hundred dollars in the bank to thousands. And when I left, it must have been uh, close to, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. That was available to the community for doing whatever and building whatever the, the, the community wanted. Well, that's a fabulous story. I must tell you, Bruce, after having spent uh, hour after hour watching a granddaughter play softball in Rancho Bernardo Community Park and uh, almost as many hours watching a grandson play basketball in the rec center, uh, I'm personally very grateful to you. The museum is very grateful to you for sharing your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you.